This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. <laughs> you never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. <laughs> We're going to do a little different from that. I'd like everybody to close their eyes for a moment. And when I'm done speaking, I like to take in a deep breath in and a deep breath out. And as you do that, reflect on just how fortunate you are to live in this amazing area and that you have the type of compassion for the homeless that brings you here tonight. Okay? Doesn't that feel good? <laughs> My name is Glenn Batchelor, and I'm a partner with Social Venture Partners of Santa Barbara. We work with local nonprofits to help them build their capacity. And one of our areas of focus is homelessness. For the last few months, we have been working with the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness, or C3H, as it's affectionately called. And one of the things we've been working together on is this summit. The idea for the summit was, came from the observation that every two years we do a homeless count. And there's a lot of attention on this issue. 600 plus volunteers come out. And we thought, wouldn't it be a great idea if we could capture even a portion of that energy when there wasn't a homeless count? Our other sponsors tonight are Arts and Lectures, Sarah Miller McCune, the McCune Foundation, and the Santa Barbara Foundation. Let's give them all a big hand. But most of all, thank you for being here, especially during a winter that's unusually warm and there's no headline-grabbing crises related to homelessness, at least not at the moment. I think it's a real testament to this community that as many people are here as are here tonight. And you are an awesome audience, not just because you're here, but with the information that you provided when you registered for the event showed that nearly 70% of you were interested in getting actively involved with homelessness, whether it's to donate for the stock drive or to volunteer. And to, and to recruit more new volunteers to work on homelessness is one of the desired outcomes of this summit. Now, I want to talk about what's different tonight. How many of you have been to a talk on homelessness before? Let's see a show of hands. An awful lot of you. Well, I bet you're wondering, you know, what's different about this summit and how's it going to help us better address homelessness? Well, I think there's a, th a few reasons why. First of all, tonight is going to be very much about solutions and results. We're not going to dwell on the problems and some of the issues. Um, I think a lot of you are very well versed in them, but it's going to be focused on solutions and results. 
Secondly, it's going to have more of an external perspective. We're certainly going to talk about Santa Barbara, but we're also going to talk about what's working around the country. And we're going to especially hear from Fresno and Pasadena, two communities that have made big strides in terms of reducing homelessness. But as we're talking about these other communities, we're obviously going to be coming from a place of just total respect and appreciation for all the incredible, tireless work that is done by so many individuals and so many organizations in this county. And I, I think you all agree, wouldn't you? <laughs> Last thing about the summit that is, that is different is that it's not an end tonight. It's really a beginning for many actions to come, and some of which are, are listed on this slide. For example, this afternoon, more than 100 providers from around the county came to workshops. And the intent of that was to foster collaboration throughout the county and to accelerate the implementation of several important programs. Now, speaking of action, you may have been wondering why you have these devices in your hand. Well, you're going to get involved tonight and participate starting right now. Now, get these devices out. <laughs> And these are, these are eye clickers, for those of you who aren't familiar with them. Professors here at UCSB use them to get instant polling from their students in the class. And we're going to get instant polling from you tonight on several questions. All you need to do is press the orange button, and it'll show, it'll show an AA initially, and then it will show ready. And then just A, B, C, D, answer the question, and we're going to see the results up here in a moment. Okay, everybody with me? Yeah. All right, great. The question, just to get people started, relative to our population, how does the number of homeless in our county compare with the average California community? And you have three choices, more, less, or about the same. And I'll give you a few seconds to come up with that. Wow, you're fast. Look at, look at the numbers changing up there in the left-hand corner. All right, slowing down. I'm going to stop it right there. All right, let, let's, see, let's see what you said. Wow, 86% said about the same. Uh, one person said E. You weren't listening. <laughs> You're definitely not paying attention. All right. <laughs> OK. All right, very good. Well, the answer is actually less. Um, and it's a little bit of a trick question because some of you may have been thinking about Santa Barbara the city as opposed to Santa Barbara the, the county. But as the entire county, it's actually less. If you isolate the city, it's, it's a lot more. And, 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 you, and there's a lot of speculation why that may be. But I've looked at a lot of data. And what some of the data shows is that, first of all, cities have a lot more homelessness than non-cities. And secondly, destination cities, particularly ones with beaches have even that much more. So that may or may not be the total explanation, but it's certainly uh, a factor. Another um, defining characteristic of our county is if we have quite a bit more chronic homeless than the average California community, about 50% more. So just to give you a little bit of sense so we're all sort of on the same page. Now, since you're so adept at these, I'm going to ask you another question. And the question is, how do you rate the problem of homelessness in Santa Barbara today versus prior years? Now, unlike the first question, there are not, is not a right or a wrong answer. It's more of a feeling type of thing. And you can define prior years any way that you'd like. And your choices are improved, worse, or about the same. All right, here we go. Look how speedy you are. I am so impressed. All right, we're going to get around 300. That's probably do it. And look at that. Wow, quite a, quite a dispersion this time. This time, we've got three people that aren't paying attention. Oh, no, four. Four people that aren't paying attention. But anyways, it's interesting that, you know, it's relatively similar between the three, with worse being the, the first. Um, I think regardless of how you answered this, I think we'd all agree that more progress is needed and that there's always room for improvement. 
And with that in mind, I want to cover just a few more things. And first, we've got to get rid of that slide. There we go. This is how the Department of Housing and Urban Development looked at our progress and our processes in 2012. And your first reaction to that might be, wow, 85 out of 134, that's horrible. That would fail here at UCSB. But a couple of things from perspective. First of all, it's really hard to get a high score. There are actually some communities in the country that have a score half of our score. But also, the national average is slightly higher than this, just to give you an idea. The second thing is, this is 2012, and there's been a number of new initiatives since that time. So the hope is that those numbers will go up in, in, future, in future scores. Talking about new initiatives, probably the biggest one of all is the creation of C3H a little more than a year ago. The purpose of C3H is to harness all of the county's resources to reduce homelessness and to reduce the impacts of homelessness. And this is no easy job because there's a lot of history on this issue and there's a lot of coordinating to do. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we have three people that are doing, working on it. Uh, one is Angela Antonori, the second is Jeff Schaefer, and the third is, is Zara Nahar Moore. And I think they deserve a huge hand. <laughs> I hate slides like this, but I'm going to show it anyways. Uh, C3H is more than just the three people. It's a network of committees and work teams. And But just to give you a sense of this, um, there's a lot involved in the community in terms of bringing this together. And one of the out puts or outcomes from this um, has been five strategies that were developed for the county. And, 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 and this is just really just a, a real short capsulization. There's more detail, there's sub-strategies, there's goals, all sorts of things below this. But it's basically to prevent homelessness, a data-driven and culture so that we can make decisions and resource allocation based on facts. Thirdly, more housing, of course more housing, but what's meant here is not only more stock, but, but more approaches to solving the housing issues, collaboration, and also ongoing dialogue. And this summit is an example of that tonight. And then lastly, to encourage self-sufficiency among the homeless as it is appropriate. One of the other amazing outcomes is housing placement. One of those, one of those um, teams that was listed on that diagram a couple of slides ago was a housing placement team, and they've been working together for more than a year. But the data has really come together since about last May. And look at the increases in terms of placements, in terms of the chronic and vulnerable house, and in terms of total homeless house. And as impressive as all those numbers are in just a nine-month time period, I think what maybe is even more impressive is that in nine months since last May, this team has been able to house three 380 homeless individuals. Isn't that fantastic? Just a couple more things in terms of initiatives and, and I think really promising signs. Uh, one is the homeless court, which was created, and the idea of that is to stabilize the lives of homeless folks and to minimize uh, criminal behaviors related to homelessness. Second is restorative policing, where we have dedicated officers that work with the homeless, uh, not, not as criminals, but as clients, and to try to steer them towards the services that they need. Thirdly, we've had two veteran stand-down events. Um, the most recent one was this past October, where more than, nearly 500 veterans re received care and services. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that fabulous? <laughs> And lastly, we have two projects that are on the cusp of beginning. One is in the Milpas area and one is in Lompoc. The Milpas pro project is to test the housing first approach, which for those of you who are not aware of that, it's basically to house the most chronic and vulnerable as quickly as possible and then provide them the services so they can stay in their housing. And that will be starting in the next month or two. And then in Lompoc, there's really a community-wide collaboration to try to reduce homelessness. So both of these absolutely bear watching. So just wanted to give you a snapshot and paint a picture. Obviously, this is not everything related to Santa Barbara. Um, and before we bring up our speakers for tonight, um, I, we're going to show you just a short slide slideshow. And thank you very much. <clears throat>
say Hailing him And where he is these days Life is hard You have to change Life is hard You have to change Our first speaker, Becky Canis, hardly even needs an introduction. Becky is a graduate of West Point. She was nine years in the, US, in the United States Army, and she was in special operations. After coming, being in the military, she went to New York City and helped reduce homelessness in the Times Square area over a four-year period of over 80%. Let me repeat that. I didn't say 8%. I said over 80%, which is pretty amazing. She then took those experiences and helped found the 100,000 Homes Campaign with the intention of housing 100,000 chronically vulnerable homeless people by this summer, and they're well on their way. She also is co-founder of the Social Change Agency, which helps leaders promote social change. Um, I am sure glad that we booked Becky a long time ago, because after her notoriety uh, being on 60 Minutes two weeks ago, I'm not sure if we could have gotten her, but, uh, but, but Becky is a, uh, likens herself as a bit of a pot stirrer, and so um, let's give Becky a huge welcome as she comes up here and stirs the pot. It's a real honor to be here. Um, thank you, Glenn, for, for inviting me, and thank you to my friends in Santa Barbara for giving me the opportunity to share with you um, some of the experiences that I've learned in working with communities across the country, and I hope that it's of service for you and what you're doing to work towards end homelessness in Santa Barbara. Um, so uh, I think I have some slides that I should I just click next. Hey, all right. Here's the deal. I lead a national movement of over 235 cities working together to find and house the most long-term and vulnerable people off the streets of America, uh, 100,000 of them by July 2014. And in, in, in that, well, yeah, that's what I do. That's just my job. Um, and, uh, and, and what I get as a result of that is, is an experience of getting to see what works in a lot of different communities and what works and what doesn't work. And, and I'm, I'm excited to share that with you tonight. Um, and, and hopefully some lessons that you can pull out that are relevant for what you want to do here in Santa Barbara. Um, and I also want to take you behind the scenes a little bit of being the director of the 100,000 Homes Campaign and kind of having it out there, a little bit exposed with a very bold and ambitious but time-bound goal for what, what happened for us as a team, stuff that we don't often talk about in, in a public forum with a hope that there can be some lessons for you in that as well. So are you guys okay if I expose my, my team and make us a little bit vulnerable here? Are you guys all right with that? Okay, all right. So. Let's get started with the vulnerability party then. So, um, so in July 2010, um, uh, we launched this effort to find and house 100,000 of the most long-term and vulnerable people by July 2013. Uh, I'll be honest with you, we, we just completely made it up. We were like, that's a really big number. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? And at the time, there were only 35 cities in the United States who were part of this effort, and they had only housed uh, 5,000 of the most long-term and vulnerable people off the streets, which that was in and of itself pretty remarkable. Um, and we invited communities to be part of this. We trained communities for free in how to do a registry week where you go out and you survey everybody who's sleeping outside between 4 and 6 in the morning. The, the biggest registry week that I ever know of that's ever been done was done in Santa Barbara County with over 500 volunteers. <laughs> mm. 
And you guys should feel great about that. And, and that creates an, an emotional event for a community and it gets you all tired too. So then you can be in a space, it's like military tactics of breaking people down. Um, so you can be in this space where you're open to trying something new. Um, and, and when we first started the campaign, we thought that was enough. You know, we thought, oh, let's just get people out having these, you know, transformative emotional experiences and they'll start housing people and, 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 and it'll all work out and somehow it'll add up to 100,000 someday. <laughs> and uh, so by a year and a half into the campaign, uh, by December 2011, uh, there were 11,390 people in housing who arguably would not have ever possibly been in housing and most likely might have ended up dead on the streets. Um, so that, that was wonderful and more communities had joined. But my, my, my data guy, uh, pulled me and the team aside and we had a, a big retreat about this where we went through our results and we faced into results and he was like, I have some good news and I have some bad news. I said, okay, well, let's hear the bad news first, right? Everyone wants to hear the bad news first. And he said, well, we're on track to beat the 30,000 homes campaign. Um, and, uh, was, you know, that was a significant emotional event. And, and um, we, as a team, we faced into the possibility that we had kind of put ourselves out there exposed and, you know, we, we, we got all these people doing this thing and it could just be on, on paper, at least, a horrible failure, right? Like 30,000 isn't even out of the realm of embarrassment, you know? Like 70,000 is like, all right, A for effort, you know, but we were not even close to that. I said, all right, well, give me the good news. And he said, okay, if three new communities join every month, starting now, and if you can help those communities improve their performance, from housing an average of 1.6% of their chronic and vulnerable population every month to housing 2.5% of their chronic and vulnerable population every month, then not only will this movement reach 100,000 people in housing, but it also puts all those communities that get to that 2.5% threshold on track to end homelessness in their community within four years, that it actually really is within grasp and it's something possible. So that was what we oriented all our strategies on as a team. And it only came about because we faced into this data. We faced into the fact that we were not on track for where we wanted to be. But also as the director of the program, I did this time out and I said, wait a minute, okay, what if it is a great big failure? You know, what if it just is only, only 30,000 people in housing, which I would argue that that's actually a success as well. What is it that is our, our deepest values that we care about the most about creating in the world? And it was unanimous on our team that what we cared about was that every single person experiencing homelessness in America was known by name by the communities who are entrusted with doing something about this, regardless of whether or not they sought help, regardless of whether or not they showed up at a shelter. And that, that to me was what got us up in the morning, actually, was this belief that there are people who are extremely uh, vulnerable, very medically fragile, who don't have the wherewithal to get to the shelter, or even in some communities, the shelter won't accept them anymore. We were like, you at least got to know them and you know their names and their pictures and make it real. So if that happens, that's a success regardless of the numbers. And the other was, let's, hey, let's give it a shot at helping communities get to this 2.5% per month. Let's see what we can do to help move that needle forward. So we completely reorganized my team. And you know, I know sometimes people pay consultants lots of money to do organizational redesigns. We said, we went out on the back deck of this ranch and we said, everybody who's gonna help communities enroll, stand in that corner. And everybody who's gonna help communities improve, stand on that corner. And you know, if you're not sure what you should do, just pick one. And that became our new org chart. <laughs> it was just done. <laughs> Um, so we completely reorganized the team and we actually, we voted on who would be the team leaders amongst the people. And, and I had a, a, a 25 year old supervising a 60 year old and it worked out great. Um, and just this organic leadership developed. Um, we realized we would need one more year to succeed, just one more year. So we called every single community and every single investor and said, can we have one more year? Are you still with us? And every single person but one said, yes, we're still in. And the person who said no, now they want to get back in on it. Um, <laughs> so maybe the Anderson Cooper uh, effect. Um, <laughs> I'll say, people ask me, is Anderson Cooper as cool as he seems? He's even cooler. He's really... Uh, and uh, we initiated a transparent 
data feedback loop, which I want to share with you what that looks like. So this, we, we started sending communities once a month a report that said, here's how you're doing vis-a-vis -vis this 2.5%, and here's how you're doing compared to other communities with similarly sized homeless populations, which was pretty provocative. We, I, we were scared to do this. Um, and, and transparency of data and being honest about performance, I think, is one of the things that can have some of the most, trans one of the most transformative effect at the community level and at the national level of just being really honest about how we're doing. Um, so I think that's a super powerful thing. Uh, we also created something called the 2.5% Club, um, which was uh, any community who houses at 2.5% of their population per month uh, for three months in a row gets brought into this, what we envisioned as this very elite 2.5% club, which is something kind of geeky to make um, elite and awesome. Um, but we did our best um, to, to make it a thing, and I'll share with you about that for a minute. Um, we partnered with the Rapid Results Institute, um, who I'll explain what they did, um, and we went on a positive deviant treasure hunt. And I think all these things that I'm about to tell you are things that you could do at the local level to, to transform what's happening in Santa Barbara. So here's that positive feedback loop. Now, we were a little afraid that people would get these and be really angry at, at being exposed, but we never wanted to shame or embarrass anybody. I think that's another really important thing. Um, but uh, nobody, nobody complained. I think, and I said this, I think it's possible they just didn't open their emails, but nobody got upset about they, they, they saw it as a motivating factor. Uh, this is the, the debut of the 2.5% Club. When we first named this as a thing, there were only 13 cities in America that we knew of that were housing at this rate. And so we were able to get them all recognized in front of their, their peers at our, an, our, at our sector's annual conference, which was wonderful. But we said, hey, 13 communities housing at a rate to end homelessness you know, that's not enough, what can we do? So we brought in the Rapid Results Institute and they actually work all over the developing world. They don't do, they, until they worked with us, they didn't do work in America. They only worked in Africa and Nepal and um, South America. Um, but what they do is they bring together groups of people none of whom report to one another, which is exactly the scenario we have in homelessness, none of whom have to answer to one another. They form a team and they unleash that team to set its own unreasonable 100-day goal and go about accomplishing it, and they support them in doing that. So it's, it wasn't, nobody told them that you have to do better, nobody told them what their goal should be, they were just set loose to come up with their own goal. And as a result of that, 54 communities more than doubled their monthly housing placement rate in just 100 days, which is really just phenomenal. And as a result of that, um, the 2.5% the club now has 52 members. Um, and so it just it keeps growing. And what excites me about that is that there's 52 cities in America now, every size, every geography, all over the place, that, that are housing at a rate that puts them on a trajectory to end homelessness within four years. And they didn't think that that was possible before. And now, I, what I hope is that it becomes unthinkable that you could not do that, since there's so many that are doing that. And the last thing I want to share is that we created this self-assessment tool where we wanted to find out what, what are communities doing that accounts for disparities in performance? Why are some communities doing better from others? How can we understand what that is? And then how can we bottle what it is that's happening in these 2.5% club communities and share that with everybody else? And here's what we found that accounts for disparities in performance with housing the most chronic and most vulnerable off the streets. Um, so then this is the gist of what I hope to share with you is creating a housing first systems wide. So uh, that means you house people first and then you sort everything else later and it's not just one provider, it's the whole system does that. The second one is a continuously updated vulnerability list. So that registry week that some people do once a year or once ever, that it's updated real time all the time. Um, that the eligibility for housing is not set by the providers, it's set by the community at large, and that's really implicit in a coordinated entry system, which I know is a priority here. And that you make your decisions based on data. And you look at your performance um, and you, you, you allocate resources to, pe to people who are doing well. And if people aren't performing well, you either work to help them improve or you give the resources to people who are going to do the right stuff with it. 
And finally, there's concrete plans to leverage mainstream resources. So especially uh, CDBG and Medicaid, that that was correlated with a higher rate. So we've been busy doing everything we can to find communities that are doing those things and share with everybody else how it is that you do these things. And some of them are here in the room with you um, to share with you some of those ideas tonight. I'm happy to tell you that um, all these things just happen to have worked. So right now, today, we're, we're actually at over 85,000 people are in housing. So it's, it's turned around. <laughs> I like doing this. Let's see. That's y'all. That's y'all. All right. Um, yeah. So we're probably going to hit um, this, this, the, the hundred thousandth person moving into housing actually early, early. Now it's still kind of late, remember, because we got an extra year. But we just, we just made up the hundred thousand in the first place, right? So it's, it's still kind of amazing. So here's a couple things I want to share of, of um, some lessons learned from this that I hope are useful for you. First is as soon as you can face into your performance data, whatever it is it is, and I have a, I'm going to give you guys a glimpse of what it is from, from our perspective, from our vantage point. Um, and if it's not going your way, do something different. I don't care what it is, just something, you know, do something different. Um, don't comfort yourself with an A for effort. That would be my advice. Um, I would encourage you to create a transparent feedback loop at the local level for provider performance. How are people doing? Who's housing the most chronic and vulnerable people? And, and how long are they staying in that housing? And have that information be available to everyone in the community so that we can know who's doing well and not have that be a mystery or just a function of who has the best PR machine. Recognize and reward positive results at forums like this. Bring the best, best providers out and recognize and appreciate them. And then the things that are shown to work, you don't have to, that's not a mystery anymore. You don't have to make it up. Like there's, it's, there's, there is stuff that really makes a difference. All right, so that's what we've learned on our journey and coming back from being the 30,000 homes campaign. And I wanna see if you guys are willing for to have it to be your turn to face into your data. Are you guys okay? Yeah. All right, all right. All right, I have good news and I have bad news. <laughs> Actually, I have some really, some, some pretty cool news here. So, because Santa Barbara enrolled in the 100,000 Homes campaign a long time ago, you guys were one of the earlier communities that enrolled and you've been reporting on the number of people you've moved into housing since February of 2011. What this is, is this shows every month since February 2011 how many people you've moved into housing. And so you can see uh, there's a big, big jump here. And, and that was because a large, a, a large housing residence opened. And, and that was awesome. But then after you got everybody in there, then oops, it's back down to here, right? And, at the, and that seems to be your normal tra trajectory. Um, but Santa Barbara fielded a team and they went to the boot camp and, and, and look what's happening. Like things are, things are really on an upswing here. And uh, there, there's, a, a, I think, a, a clear trajectory of improvement that is effectively the same as opening a housing residence without having done so, right? It's this, it's this unleashing of all this existing potential that was there all along. It's that everybody's working together differently. So I, I think Santa Barbara is to be applauded for your, your improvement in performance. I think it's exceptional. Um, that is a huge, huge improvement. Okay, so here's the bad news: is is that you know it's definitely an A for effort, and um, there's still a little bit more work to do to get into that two and a half percent club. If that's something that you want to do, which I would encourage you to do that, because it does mean you're on a track to end homelessness. So for Santa Barbara to be in the two and a half percent club, you would need to be moving 46 uh, people into housing every month. 46 of your most long-term, most vulnerable, everybody's given up on that person, that person, that would be who you need to move into housing. 46 people like that every month. And for the last three months, the average has been more like 32, which is still amazing, right? That's still a great improvement, but there's still a little bit more 
more to do. And I think the answer to that lies into some of the stuff that's being forwarded right now. It's, it's in all these things. It's in implementing housing first, creating a coordinated system, using data, coordinated entry. All those things are in the works, and I would encourage you to just go all out and make those things happen as quickly as possible. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this slide um, <laughs> and, and just really ask you, as a community, what new commitments are you willing to make to improve your performance, to take it to the next level? It's good. It could be great. That's what I would say. And if you know what you needed to do, if you know what worked in other communities, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's some basic stuff that works. Uh, the last thing that I want to leave you with is uh, from, from one of my mentors, Katie Hendricks, and I love this story. She says that an airplane gets where it's going by being off course 99% of the time, right? So take heart. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect. You can even come back from being the 30,000 homes campaign. Um, that, it's, that really what life is all about is catching yourself when you're on course and getting back on course catching yourself when you're off on course and getting back on course. So this is an invitation to you as a community to take some risks and try some things um, and, and take it to 11, as they say on Spinal Tap, right? And, uh, and I think I, I have every confidence that you can do that. Um, I'm excited to be part of those conversations and, and offer the, the full support of me and my whole team in, in your efforts to make that happen. And I also appreciate the opportunity to, to share these, these hopefully this instructive story with you guys. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I have a, a, a real special treat. Thank you. Thank you for that applause. I just want to take a moment, let that in. Um, I have a very special retreat, uh, treat for you. Uh, and I'm about to introduce a real fireball all the way from Fresno, California. So I want you guys to meet Jody Ketchaside. She's been working on homelessness for over 14 years, and not just with the chronically homeless, but with the youth and families and victims of human trafficking, survivors of human trafficking. Um, and she, she is an operator herself of, of a housing program that houses the most vulnerable people called Turning Point of Central California. But she's also the chairperson, chairperson for the Fresno Madera Continuum of Care. So she's just the whole gamut. Um, she's an amazing human being. But here's the thing that should have all of you leaning forward in your seats to can't wait to hear what she has to say, is that she led the team from Fresno through their boot camp experience, their rapid results boot camp, and they, at their max, at their peak in their improvement of performance, improved their performance by a thousand percent. And they've leveled off now. They're at a mere 700 percent. So, they're, you know, she's kind of slacking a little bit. You might want to give her a little bit of hard time. Um, but this, Jody is the leader who made that happen in Fresno, and I think she has some some words of wisdom to share with you about about what you guys can do here too. So thank you all, and please welcome Jody to the stage. Wow, there's a lot of you out there. Hi. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I'm from the area, so I was excited when I was invited to come. I do only have seven minutes, so I'm going to get started. So when we got started <clears throat> and attended the boot camp, we were housing only three chronically homeless and homeless veterans per month. <clears throat> it was taking them six months to find housing from the time we issued a Shelter Plus Care voucher. The community was unaware of our participation in the campaign. And uh, we had over 30 open shelter plus care vouchers and a lack of shelter beds, which made the homeless population extremely visible and there was a lot of ne negative publicity around that. <clears throat> so initially we attended the boot camp. In the first 30 days, we introduced the campaign to the community. We had a continuum of care planning uh, annual meeting and reintroduced it outlined the goals that we had set for the community and uh, got everybody on board. 
We actually sat in on a biweekly case conferencing call with Santa Barbara to learn how to do that and implement it at locally. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> and then we continue to meet weekly as a team. At the 100-day mark, we maintained the team structure. We met every single week without fail. Um, we were able to appeal to the city to fund what we called assessment beds uh, in order to co compensate for the fact that we didn't have shelter. So we were able to put people into an apartment and then transition them in place once their funding, their subsidi subsidy came through. Uh, we identified new goals in order to keep the momentum going, engage the faith-based community and um, into a needs navigator type of model, and worked on public relations. So today we're still meeting bi-weekly. We've identified champions within the community. Uh, we are combining our pit counts on our registry weeks, and then everything that we started initially is still ongoing. So this is our progress. We started at three, we peaked at 33, and now we're holding between 16 and 20 on a monthly basis, which is an, a, an average of a 700% increase. Uh, we were able to get 110 assessment beds funded by the city. We do um, bi-weekly or monthly mini Homeless Connect events. We have zero open shelter plus care vouchers now from 30. In our 2013 pit count, we had a 30% reduction in overall homelessness. And this year, we these are rough numbers because we just did it, but there was a 20% decrease in unsheltered homeless in the pit count. And our Needs Navigator program, or the Fresno Wings program, is um, in full swing with trainings getting started and, and um, it's getting off the ground. Oh, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> And then my contact information is there should you um, want to reach out. But I think that my, my, the, what I would leave you with is just, um, like we learned a lot from you. We'd be happy to get involved and, and, and do whatever we can to help Santa Barbara get to where they want to be. And just accept no obstacle. Don't embrace an, obst an obstacle. Yeah. There's always a way over it, around it, or under it. Thank you. Thank you, Jody, for sharing how a community can change and make rapid results. Our next speaker and our next city that we'll be talking about is a different story, which is Pasadena. This city has had a long record of effective programming and reducing homelessness, and our next speaker, Ann Lansing, has had a big part to do with that. She is the project planner for the Pasadena Housing Department, and where she oversees the homeless housing for the city. She is also the co-chair for their, their version of the collaborative, um, which is a homeless and housing network. She has also been instrumental in making sure that the city had a 10-year plan, and she spearheaded a project called Project Housed Pasadena that has housed 55 chronic and vulnerable homeless folks. And they've been able to stay in their house for two year period, 90% of them. So phenomenal, phenomenal results. I'm almost tired hearing about all this. She's done so much. So let's give a big welcome to Ann Lansing from Pasadena. <laughs> Hi everyone, and thanks very much for the opportunity to be here today. We are very proud of what we've accomplished in Pasadena, and I'm happy to be able to share that with you. Um, as mentioned, um, my name is Ann Lansing, and I am the I'm staff at the housing department at the city of Pasadena, and the co-chair of Pasadena's Housing and Homeless Network. Let me give a little overview of Pasadena so you can put it in context of your own community. It's got a population of about 140,000 people, um, approximately 23 square miles, and as mentioned, we have a long history of providing homeless services. Um, we have the Pasadena Housing and Homeless Network, which, which 
which has been our principal planning entity for homeless services since 1991. And we've conducted a homeless count since 1992. And at this point, we do the count annually. Um, the, the history of providing, homelessness, of providing homeless services is actually both a pro and a con. Um, we, we do have infrastructure, but with many years of doing homeless services, things can get entrenched. There can be services that are very effective in ending homelessness for certain groups of people, but not for the larger population as a whole. And it can be hard to change that um, when best practices come along. So this is um, Dorothy. Dorothy is, is pretty a pretty good example of the face of homelessness in Pasadena. And Dorothy was one of the people who we outreached to when we did our 100,000 Homes campaign. Um, a snapshot of homelessness before we, we engaged in the 100,000 Homes campaign, the 2011 homeless count showed a count of over 1,200. It had been the third year of increasing numbers, and it was the highest count we had seen since we began doing a count, um, a historic count. And there was a disproportionate representation among that homeless population of the mentally ill, the physically handicapped, and substance abusers. And as mentioned, the homeless services that we had in place worked well to end the homelessness of many, but not really for that chronic population. So we knew that something had to change, and it, the question was, what, we were, what were we going to do? Um, so one of the things that we determined needed to ha happen was increasing our uh, stock of permanent supportive housing. So in 2011, when we began the 100,000 Homes campaign, we had Shelter Plus Care certificates. Um, we had 60 of them, and we had a limited amount of permanent supportive housing. We had 36 beds of permanent supportive housing, but most of that was for uh, families and not really the most vulnerable population. Um, so between then and now, we have we've increased our Shelter Plus Care by maximizing the utilization of the units. We went from 60 to 75 uh, Shelter Plus Care units and are still increasing that by increasing the client's income to allow us to serve more people. Um, and we also increased the permanent supportive housing quite, quite a bit, from 36 to 168 units. And that was primarily by converting a single room occupancy building that had been affordable housing but not deeply affordable and not targeted to the chronically homeless to a permanent supportive housing building focusing on chronically homeless individuals and um, additionally putting an emphasis on housing first. So housing first, um, as mentioned, uh, Project House Pasadena was something that we took on, and that utilized the vulnerability index that Becky talked about earlier. Um, we launched that in August of 2011. We, we did outreach over three nights and surveyed about 250 people, and of that, 60 of them met the vulnerability criteria. And we've housed 55 of those persons to date, and 95% of them remained in housing after one year, and 90% have remained housed um, now that we're at two years. And of those, the average length of time homeless was 10 years. One of the gentlemen who we housed had been homeless a mind-boggling 40 years. He was 59 years old when we housed him, and so he had basically never been housed his entire adult life and um, ended up being permanently housed. So we used the Housing First model, um, providing direct access to permanent housing and then the wraparound services to help people keep housed. And those services were primarily health and mental health, but also included education, employment, training and placement, and substance abuse. And as with a true Housing First model, we did not require people to become sober before moving into housing. We didn't require them to take meds or, ha or anything like that prior to being housed. Um, so we've seen some encouraging results since we began doing this. We've seen a 36% decrease since 2011. Um, and as you can see, 2011 was, as I said, the highest we'd ever seen. As of the 2013 count, we were down to 772. That was the 36% decrease. And though this is not official yet, we did a count in January of this year. We do, do, we do conduct an annual count. And it looks like our number is going to be about 600. So we're continuing to see um, substantive decreases.
So moving forward, what are the next steps? Um, one of the primary next steps, in my opinion, is managing expectations. Housing first is, is vital, and housing saves lives, and it saves money for a community. People's symptoms improve, their illnesses are treated, they, they began to participate more in the community. But it's not a cure for mental illness, and it's not a cure for substance abuse. So people will have symptoms, people may relapse, um, but that doesn't mean that, house, that you don't continue with the housing first policies. Um, we're also moving forward with a coordinated entry system. Um, this, is a, this is where everybody is assessed using the same tool and then prioritized for the appropriate housing intervention. We're happy to be part of a United Way pilot program in LA County. We're the only community in the San Gabriel Valley participating in that, and that has allowed us access to countywide resources that we wouldn't have had access to before. Pasadena is its own continuum of care and has a finite number of homeless resources available. This gives us Los Angeles County resources um, that are available for us. Um, since participating in the pilot program, we've We've assessed 300 people since December, and five of those have been housed, and there's another five who are in the process of being housed. And we're doing this primarily using repurposed resources, and I think this is a really important point to make. Except for certain particular populations, veterans, for example, the, the resources that are going to be available to you you're not going to necessarily see an increase in resources that are available. So you have to look at what you have in your community and look at repurposing that. So for example, um, we've accessed HOPWA, Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS, housing vouchers for people who we are identifying through the coordinated entry system. And HOPWA had traditionally not been a pot of money that we had been using for chronically homeless individuals. So we've been successful with that thus far. And this final picture I'm going to leave you with, this is Dorothy now. Dorothy was assessed back in August of 2011 when we did our vulnerability index. She wasn't actually housed until May of 2012. It took that long to build trust with her. She had been homeless for many, many years, had been an addict for many years prior to becoming homeless, and it had a lot of really negative experiences. So it took a while to build trust, and it took actually one of her friends from the street who got housed through Project House Pasadena to tell her, these people are for real, and work with them, and you may get housed. And so she got housed. Um, one of the most important things to her was that she got her smile back. Um, if you saw the first picture, um, her, her teeth were in not very good shape, and we were able to get uh, a dentist in the community to volunteer to assist with that, and that was really important to Dorothy, and she's been since then a, a real face to this campaign willingly where she goes and talks about how positive and what a, a positive effect this has had on her. And you can actually follow Dorothy's journey if you go to the City of Pasadena website and go to the housing department. Dorothy's journey is on there because it happened that a reporter was following her separate and distinct from the 100,000 Homes campaign. So it's a really great story to follow. Thank you, Anne, for sharing Pasadena's impressive story. I could spend the rest of the evening and not do justice to the resume of our next speaker, Philip Mangano. Philip uh, currently is president and CEO of the American Roundtable to Abolish Homelessness, where he consults uh, internationally and nationally with, uh, with communities and organizations to end homelessness. Prior to that, he was the executive director of the Interagency for Homelessness uh, on the federal level, where during his tenure from 2002 to 2009, um, they increased federal spending on homelessness every single year. He helped 350 communities um, develop a 10-year plan, and during between 2005 and 2009, reduced chronic homelessness 36% in the country and 12% overall. Pretty darn impressive. Um, but I think, in addition to all of those things, maybe one of the most impressive things about Philip is that he was awarded the Public Servant of the Year nationally um, in 2006. And what's particularly 
impressive about that is that in the history of the award, he is the only one that has ever won that award from a federal position. Pretty darn impressive. Let's give a huge welcome to Philip Mangano. Thank you so much, Glenn, and I'm so glad to see so many people here. You should give yourself applause on what your community is doing. I think this is a percentage of the total number of people who live in Santa Barbara. Would that be right, Mayor? Look around. I think it is. This is great. But I would be remiss if I didn't start by saying what you all know. We're right in the heart of Black History Month in our country a month in which we appreciate the myriad of contributions that our black neighbors have made to our country. And I'm always impressed with Dr. King, of course, and we're just in the wake of that great celebration, the 50th anniversary of his talk in Washington. One of the things that he said he was actually paraphrasing an abolitionist from the old days, from the 1850s, when the effort was made to end another social wrong, another social evil in our country that most people in the country did not believe could be done. Slavery was accepted both north and south. It was enabled. The strategies were all wrong for it. And an abolitionist way back then talked about this very idea that Dr. King talked about, in which Dr. King believed. And what he said was this. He said that the long moral arc of history, the long moral arc of our American experience bends toward Justice, exactly. That's an incredible statement, isn't it, when we think about it? Because certainly, when we think about moral wrongs, the idea that they bend at all is astonishing. And certainly, we don't see that every day. We don't see it every week or month or year or even sometimes a decade. But the assurance that he had from looking at the American experience was that that moral arc does indeed bend. He looked back to the inclusion of the Bill of Rights in our Constitution. He looked back at the work of the abolitionists who bent that arc into the lives of people who were owned. He looked back at the work of the suffragists who against all odds and against a lot of stereotyping accomplished their effort as well. And of course, he looked at the civil rights movement that he was a part of. In 1956, he gave a speech in Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, and he talked about ending segregation in this nation in 10 years. He was wildly applauded in that church, but there was rampant skepticism and cynicism. You could even say agnosticism that that could actually be accomplished. Wasn't it, after all, part of the social fabric? But we know that back 10 years later, exactly 10 years later, in 1966, Dr. King went back to the Ebenezer Baptist Church and talked about the ending of segregation in this country. He had overcome all of those stereotypes that it couldn't be done, that it was impossible, it was so ingrained in our culture, it was part of the national mindset, it was an impossible thing to eradicate, but they did it. You know, in our own work on this issue of homelessness, and I've had the privilege of traveling not only across our country, but across the world on this issue, and when you travel that far, you see a lot of hopeful things, some of the things we've heard tonight, but you also hear a lot of other things. See if you've heard these things. If we build it, they will come. If we attempt to get the job done, and we create good effort here in Santa Barbara, people will be flooding here from places like Pasadena and Fresno. You've heard that. 
You know, in my travels, I heard that in every single city I went to, as if no city itself had any homeless persons. They all came from other places. It was an astonishing thing to hear. You know what the actual data says? It says this, and there have been studies done on this, that if you looked at the total population of any community, the percentage of that population that was native to that community was less than the percentage of the population of homeless people who were in that community. In other words, homeless people were more likely to have been born and reared in that community than the general population was. Now, we, we're not naive or about this. We do know that homeless people move around. Who wouldn't want to go to a beautiful beach community? We know that they move around, but I can assure you that the vast majority of people in communities around the country, and I've looked at the data on this, they are indigenous to that community. So the old saw, that old stereotype, the same kinds of stereotypes that tried to defeat the effort to uh, get rid of segregation or keep women from voting or to end slavery, they're present in our own culture. Like if they build it, they will come. Oh, do you like this one? They choose homelessness as a lifestyle. People want to go live in that culvert under that bridge, they tell us. They want to remain outside. Here's the hard reality on that, and we've seen this in communities all over the country, and you've heard a little bit of it here today in terms of Fresno and Pasadena. When offered an alternative, not a shelter, not mental health, not a detox, but when offered what homeless people actually say they want, and when you ask homeless people what they want, they are clear. They never ask for a pill, a program, or a protocol, ever. They ask for one thing, a place, a place to live. And when we actually match up that product with homeless people, those people that we say are there, they don't want to go in, they choose it as a lifestyle, they come in. There was an effort in St. Louis not many years ago. There were 90 people on the street. They said they would never come in. They'd offered them everything. We said, go get them, go get some keys, rent some apartments, get some keys, and bring those out and see what happens. When they did that, Homeless people came off the street. Those 90 seemingly intractable people, 87 of them came in within just a few months. One had died, so the vast majority of people came in. So the old axiom that they choose homelessness as a lifestyle it's just not the case. It's another one of those myths. The hard reality is when homeless people are given what they want, when they're treated as customers and consumers of our resources, they'll respond to them and come in. You've heard the one, no landlord will ever work with them. It's just something a landlord won't do. Well, the hard reality on that is all across the country, including here and in Fresno and in Pasadena, across California, across this nation, landlords are not only working with homeless people, recognizing the incentives of working with homeless people, that you have somebody who, because we understand that just placing a person in housing and just leaving them, a person is vulnerable, that doesn't work. We, we know that from deinstitutionalization. But when a person is placed in permanent supportive housing, a place to live with the support services, astonishingly, that works. And it works, as you've heard already tonight, in between 85 and 90% of the cases. Landlords appreciate the idea of having those support services to support a tenant in their, uh, in, in their housing. In fact, we were talking earlier today, and we were talking about landlords who rent a car College students maybe have more difficulties in your community and other communities. I don't know that. There's no data on that. But uh, it's quite possible that they do. So incenting landlords with the kind of support services we're talking about and with stable rent, it's a good thing. So landlords do work on this population. You've heard this one too, the whole thing, this whole effort around what we're doing here tonight and what we did today and the new effort to recalibrate what you're doing here. You've heard this, the whole thing is another waste of time. We've had commissions, committees, task forces, initiative, nothing seems to work. You've heard that one. 
Well, you know, there's never been an opportunity like the one right now in Santa Barbara. It's pretty true around the country. It's only in the last decade or so that we really understood how to respond appropriately to homeless people by asking them what they wanted, which is a sense of uh, what we've been up to. It's sad, isn't it? We now know what to do, and we know how to do it. There's not a homeless profile person. There's not a person in homelessness. We don't know what to do, we don't know, and, and we know how to do it. We know what to do, and we know how to do it. So the idea that this is just another one of those old efforts that we've made in the past is unfortunately very erroneous and very fortunate for your community that it is erroneous because there is an opportunity now to mobilize your community with the political will of your mayor, the county folk. You know, 10 elected officials just signed on to Housing First. They had D's and R's after their name, but one thing we've learned on homelessness, see if you agree with this, is that on this issue there is no D or R. We're simply Americans partnered to end a national disgrace. And it's about time we felt that way, isn't it? I think it's about time. You, you know, you may have also heard this idea that the whole housing first idea, placing people rapidly into housing, some people say that's crazy, that's part of the stereotype, that, that's crazy, you can't do that. Well, don't they have to go through years of preparation before they're ready to go into the housing? What the data says, we could have that belief, but the data and the research contradict it. Because what the data and research say is that across the country, for the most vulnerable and most disabled, people who are on the streets of communities, and you, you would think a blanket and a bowl of soup is the best that you can do, when those people are moved into housing, there's a 90 percent retention rate in Housing First. So the notion that Housing First is crazy, that's not true. But that opinion is crazy because there's data and research all over our country that shows, in fact, that gets the job done. So, I have to uncover this. Here's what's not working. If good intentions, well-meaning programs, and humanitarian gestures worked, homelessness would have already been accomplished and, and, and done away with. It would be part of the history of Santa B Barbara. Don't you agree? You've, you've had lots of that. It didn't get done. In fact, the numbers only rose. Here are some of the other things that we have to dismiss. The idea that somewhere in Washington, inside the Beltway, there's an expert at some desk, and they're going to determine, and deductively, they're going to send that plan to you, and you're going to end homelessness. It's crazy. It's inductive planning, it's local planning that really makes a difference, taking advantage of the local opportunities and the local political and civic will that get the job done. If we had more money to spend yes. to do just what we're doing, that isn't true either, actually. Federal resources increased by 1,100% during the 1990s, and homelessness increased dramatically in that same decade. So it's not just a case of having more money. Well, what, have, what has worked? Jurisdictional leadership, mayors across the country prioritizing this issue and creating plans that got the job done, approaching it in a business way, using a tipping point model. Some of you have heard of Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote that great book, The Tipping Point, a bestseller about how to get the job done. That's what he talked about right there. And in fact, what we've learned even on homelessness, it works. Also, the consumer focus, shifting from a provider-centric focus to a consumer focus. We learned that from Clay Christensen, a Harvard Business School professor in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. It has to be innovation infused as well. You have to steal the best ideas from other places. I call it the art of legitimate larceny. Steal those best ideas and nuance them to your own community. It has to be results driven. These are the things that are working. You know, Jim Collins, he wrote Good to Great and Built to Last. He tells us that results are infectious, that as soon as you start getting results, and you saw that in some of the slides earlier. And of course, Jim Collins also taught us that to get from the good to the great, you can't depend on the good that you're doing. In fact, that more, more often, the good is the enemy of the great because the good is the status quo, which tries to impede the process of going to the great. So these are just some of the ideas that are so important. When you change that verb of homelessness from managing the crisis to ending the disgrace, what you're doing here, you have to change the whole vocabulary. Conjecture and anecdote no longer hold sway. It's research and data. Process, 
which hides a lack of getting things done, needs to see to perf being performance-based, good intentions to accountability, and of course, outcomes becomes the new language, not simply inputs. It's not how many people we serve food to during a night, it's how many people we actually ended their homelessness, because that's the single metric that matters in any community. In fact, it's the single metric I would contend of homelessness. How many fewer people are suffering from the long misery of homelessness in your community? That's the single metric that we should be concerned about. There are a lot of innovative ideas for 20 years. We didn't think there was any innovation on homelessness. We just plodded along doing what we were doing in 1981. We were still doing it in 1991 and 2001. But there are innovative ideas if adopted. Would any of you go home tonight and clank away on your Smith Corona? And for those of you who are young, that's a typewriter. And for those of you, for those of you who are young, a typewriter was an instrument where you, oh, forget it. You can look it up, you can Google it and find out what it was. No, of course you go home to your personal computer in the same way, we can't be doing on homelessness what we were doing in 1981, church basement shelters, meal programs, drive-by feeding programs, not when they've been replaced by innovative ideas that the data and research say, get the job done. So we need to escalate, we need to advance how we're doing it, and there are innovative ideas, field tested and evidence based that actually do get the job done. These are the three people who were instrumental in creating a federal strategy that was getting the job done. They taught us that there were these killer bees business plan, baselines to quantify the magnitude of the problem, benchmarks that tell you how to incrementally remedy the problem, best practices, instead of having to invent everything in your own community, there are best practices that you can go out and steal, and best practices are all about things that actually reduce people, the, the, reduce homelessness in your community, and of course budget considerations are important. Nothing may be more important to the political and civic and business will we need, because if these worked, homelessness would have been history long ago in your community. Here's the new way of talking about compassion and homelessness. It's the economic consequences, because one of the things that we've discovered is homeless people randomly ricochet against these very expensive systems, and when they do, We've begun studies. There are now over 70 cost studies that are going on. There's one going on in Los Angeles right now, and they really need one down there. As you know, 60,000 people homeless in Los Angeles. It's scandalous. Here's what the cost studies discover, that in the random ricocheting of homeless people through expensive health in law enforcement systems, the annual cost is between thirty-five dollars and $150,000 per person per year. You think that person lying on the street or lying in the park isn't costly to the public purse. They are the most costly to the public purse. But when you do the housing first intervention, actually get people into housing, which is what they want, and provide the services, this is what happened. This is the cost. All across the country, the range of those 65, 70 studies now was that the cost of the housing with the enriched services was between thirteen and $25,000 a year. So if you're a public policy official, if you're an elected official and you look at this, you don't have to be Warren Buffett to figure this one out. You don't even have to be Susie Orman to figure this one out. It's pretty apparent what you should be doing, creating that housing for moral reasons, spiritual reasons, all kinds of reasons, keep a good grip on those. It's the economic reason that's moved more political and civic and business will on this issue than any of those other arguments all assembled together. What that's resulted in is this and this. And this, for veterans, and you know Secretary Shinseki following in the path of VA secretaries before him has made an astonishing commitment. This is the place where there are new federal resources on homelessness. You want to be making certain that your efforts here are taking advantage where the deepest resources are, and it's from the VA. They have an intent to get the job done, a date certain. You want to be part of that process. You want to maximize the resources. Some of the re research they're doing at the VA is going to free up even more resources to create more housing in your community. Here's what's happening in local communities. 
sub substantial reductions. Here's what's happening in Southern California. You want to be added to this list here in Santa Barbara. Your numbers have tracked up for the last few years. But I'll tell you, if San Diego and Long Beach and Ventura and San Bernardino can do it, and Glendale and Riverside and Orange County, and you just heard from Pasadena, can do it, I don't see any reason why Santa Barbara isn't going to be on this list in the very near future. This is data gathered. This is not guesswork. These are not conjectures about what the data says. This is actual data that's been collected in these communities. Jim Collins says the results are infectious, and part of what you're doing in your community is ensuring that there are results that will, in fact, become infectious in your community. It looks like there's pretty good infection going on right now as I look across this crowd, but even more people have to join with you to get the job done. Finally, you ever heard of Mohammed Yunus? Does that name ring a bell for people? Yeah. He's in Bangladesh. He's here. When is he here? Well, how propitious. <laughs> just shows there are other forces working in the universe. <laughs> Muhammad Yunus, you know his story. He was an economist with the government in Bangladesh. Every day he'd walk to his office through the poorest people on earth. Finally, one day after asking for money from him for years, and he never gave it, of course, he never stopped. Somebody asked for a loan, he did stop. Gave that person a loan, marked down what the name of that person was, where they were, put that sheet of paper in his wallet so he would have that information. You know how word of mouth is on the street, don't you? What happened the next day? <laughs> ah, exactly, everybody was asking him for a loan, weren't they? And you know what he did? Instead of walking right past him and thinking this is a waste of time, it's a drop in the bucket, he stopped, he emptied his wallet making those small loans, micro loans to everybody who asked him until he had no more money. When he got to his office that day, his fellow economist asked, what have you been doing? You were late for work. This is the first time ever. We're going to have the police look for you. And Mohammed Yunus carefully explained exactly what he was doing. And you know what his fellow economist said to him? They said, Mohammed, are you crazy? That's not going to make any difference. They'll never repay you. This is just a drop in the ocean. It's, it's just useless. What are you doing? You're an economist. You lose your job if somebody hears. Before he could lose his job, he left his job. He created, as you know, something called the Grameen Bank, which has made over 3 million loans to the poorest people on earth. Uh, what's the repayment rate on those? What the data tells us is that the repayment on those loans to the poorest people on earth, 98%. Let's say we just took a random group of people and made loans to them. Let's just say, uh, let's say Harvard University faculty. <laughs> Do you think there would be a 98% return? I don't know. I mean, we haven't done that yet, but I'm thinking maybe the poorest people on earth are winning that one. In his biography, Muhammad Yunus said this. He said, my goal is that my grandchildren We'll go to a museum someday to see what poverty once was. It's a pretty grand goal, isn't it? Your work in Santa Barbara, this conspiracy that you have, this breathing together in this room and beyond this room with your political leadership, with your civic leadership, with your business leadership, your goal is that your children will have to go to a museum to see what homelessness once was in this city. And all of you here that have your names on the lists that Angela has carefully, you know what? Someday those lists will be under glass. And they'll talk about the meeting that was convened in February of 2014 in which Santa Barbara recommitted itself to the moral and spiritual and economic goal of ending homelessness in this community. You know what? Your children will be so proud to read your name on that list.
I would say that not only are results infectious, but I think Philip's enthusiasm is infectious as well. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Thank you. We're going to have a relatively brief informal discussion um, between, facilitated by Becky Canis, but really trying to relate what's going on in Fresno and Pasadena with Santa Barbara. It's going to take about uh, 30 seconds or a minute or so to set up. So why we do that, we're going to have one more question here uh, while they set up the thing. And the question is, and th this is the type of question to see if you've been paying attention <laughs> for the evening. Which of the following factors are correlated with higher housing placement rates of chronic and vulnerable people. And here are the choices. Implementing housing first system wide means for continually updating your by name registry of people experiencing homelessness. The community, not the housing providers, set the standards for eligibility for permanent supportive housing. Community uses a data informed system for managing performance and all of the above. All right, so here we go. You must be stumped. It's not as moving as fast as before. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll see what we got here. Ah, 94% were paying attention. Good job. <laughs> All right, great. Okay, we're now going to have a brief discussion with Becky and Ann and Jody from Fresno and Pasadena, and also joining to represent Santa Barbara will be Angela Antonori and Jeff Schaefer from C3H. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> So we're hoping that this will be um, an informal conversation, but I have some, some fire starters to get the conversation going. So I hope this is a excited, heated debate. <laughs> <laughs> no throwing anything. <laughs> All right. So I want to start with, with uh, Jody and Anne, and I want to ask you, if you had a magic wand and you could share one piece of advice from your communities about what works, you know, what's working for you to end homelessness that you could share with everyone in this audience. And it's just a magic wand that, like, if, if they would do what you said. <laughs> it's like they would automatically, magically do what you said. What, what advice would you, what would you want them to do to end homelessness in their community? I think for me it goes back to what I said earlier about, um, you know, we hear that there's, the, there's this barrier. And as soon as you accept that the barrier is there, you sort of wrap your arms around it and hug it and you keep it forever, right? Like it's a barrier. And um, I think that if you could identify those barriers, put them on a list and plug away at them one by one and get rid of them, those 30 open shelter plus care vouchers had been open for years. And when I looked at him, I was like, I don't, I don't want this anymore. Why are we doing this? Why do we still have all these open vouchers? There's all these people who aren't being housed. And it was, well, there was a match issue. So we climbed over it. We, you know, there was never a moment where I said, okay, well, this is a barrier I can't do anything about next. So that would be my advice. Put it on a list and plug away at every single one of them until you don't have any. But don't ever accept them as just being there and something you have to deal with. Okay, so with my magic wand, I'm going to assume that housing first is a given, that we've all accepted that that's a really effective way to end homelessness, and then we're going from there. So from there, we have to look at the resources that we've got and realize that there are ways to get people housed that may not be the traditional ways that we're thinking of. For example, we've housed a lot of people through per traditional permanent supportive housing bricks and mortar units. We've housed a lot of people people using shelter plus care vouchers, but we've also housed a lot of people who may not show up on any of our lists or counts of people who've been housed using 
more non-traditional, but very traditional for low-income people, ways of getting people housed. Shared housing, roommate situations, and these have been really, really effective and have actually been more client-centered, I think, in a lot of times than using a Shelter Plus Care certificate or placing someone in a permanent supportive housing unit, where the person has said, okay, I feel empowered to look for housing in my community because I know I've got the support system behind me, and that housing may be a roommate type of situation or a shared housing situation. But just be creative, whatever that is that works for your community. It may not be that, it may be something else, but look what look at what works for you. Do we need the wand too? Sure. Yeah. Wand it, baby. Yeah. So I learned a great new term today, which is called pro pronoia. Is that right? It's the opposite of paranoia, which is when you feel like the universe is against you. That's paranoia. But pronoia is the idea that we that the universe is for you. That, it's, that everything in the universe is actually working toward, uh, when we talk about housing first, or whatever housing model we're talking about, I would love for us all to believe that pro noia is our reality, that, that as we gather together as a community and work together, everything is actually behind us, trying to give us every resource we can have to, to solve and end homelessness. That'd be my wand. So can anyone, everyone just say pro noia? <laughs> right on. I don't know, you have a wand? <laughs> Okay. Uh, Jeff, you're, you're reminding me of one day I woke up, and this was years ago, and I said to my, my colleague, you know, I think it's possible that people aren't actually out to get me. <laughs> and uh, and she, she scoffed at that notion. <laughs> like, no, there are people out to get you. <laughs> and uh, so I love that concept of pro noia and, and how powerful at a community. And I'm hearing from you guys, just pull out all the stops. Just go all out and no obstacle is it's too big. You can do it. That's great. Okay, next question. Um, President Obama is a magic wand. Okay, well, there you go. That was not the question. But <laughs> President Obama, you know, less than you'd think. But um, I think I, I agree with, with Philip Mangano that, that the answers are local often, you know. Um, so I, I did want to ask both Jeff and Angela, was there anything that you heard tonight that you're really excited to apply, like that you're going to get up tomorrow and say, let's, let's start doing this. We had a friendly bet behind the scenes of how many people would or wouldn't show up. And even a couple weeks ago, it was like, maybe we should change this venue. Is it too big in Campbell Hall? We had 600 people register to come here tonight. And that was amazing. And so I really believe that people want something to change. And I wasn't sure about that a year and a half ago when we started on this, and then about a year ago when we were able to work with Zara also. So the three of us were like the best solid team. We believe it, and I'm beginning to think you believe it. So thank you. Yeah, I, I believe housing is um, the ultimate solution. So whatever housing strategy we're, we're looking at, there's, there's all kinds of them. But one of our passions is to get uh, more housing stock from for housing first. So that's a big push in our community countywide is to discover. We know 85% to 99%. We know what to do and what works. So now it's just about do we have the willpower to actually make that happen? Do we have the landlords? Do we have the housing stock? Do we have the, the outreach team we need? We, so we have to develop that. But, but I take even more of a, of a heart that we're going to get it done this year. All right, great. A right, couple other questions. So again, Jody and, and Ann, I want to ask you, what do you believe has been the most useful in transforming your community's approach? What worked, what's, what do you feel like is behind the, the thousand percent improvement, you know, and the, 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 the significant reductions that you're seeing in Pasadena? I think the main thing for us was that going into it, um, we, we signed up with the campaign pretty much at its inception. As soon as it started, I think Fresno was involved, but none of us knew it. There were a handful of people who knew what it was about and what it was for, and and the rest of, of our community had no idea. So I think educating people on what we were doing, why we were doing it, what the outcome was supposed to be, and 
I, I really think that it's all about how you present things. And we were excited about it, and we were noisy about it, and we were persistent. And so there wasn't anybody who didn't know what we were doing because we were making all kinds of noise and, and shaking things up and getting landlords on board and starting to master lease things. And um, so I think really just educating the community and, and being really loud about it and making sure that you get your successes out there because you can, you can start it and you can say, we're going to do this and we're going to be really good at it. But um, it's those milestones and those, those successes getting them out there that it's working that's going to bring, I mean, essentially, ultimately the money in to keep it going and, and to keep people excited about it. Yeah, I mean, something similar for us. We got involved in the 100,000 Homes campaign in August of 2011, and we had been kicking around the idea of doing a Housing First campaign at the Pasadena Housing and Homeless Network, our homeless coalition, for probably a good year or more prior to that. And frankly, it seemed like a really daunting prospect. You, you mean we're going to house people and we're not going to ask them to be sober first? We're, you know, we're just going to let them shoot up in units? I mean, what's, what's going to happen? It was... We, we didn't know what was going to happen, and because of that, we didn't know where to start. And the 100,000 Homes campaign gave us a very distinct starting point and a very specific way to engage the community. So we had a, a number of community volunteers. It was, I don't even remember now, but it was something like 350 community volunteers. And we're a community that's pretty good about volunteering. Our homeless count is all volunteer driven. But this really was an effort that, that got people out there, got people talking about it. And it was people who'd done the count year after year who'd said, you know, it's hard for me to go out and count the same person year after year after year and not have anything to show for it. And to be able to say, okay, you're going to be involved in an effort that's not going to count them. It's, it's going to make them count by, by getting them into housing. That, that was really um, a great starting point for us. And it was also a way for us to engage, as I said earlier, having a long history of providing homeless services is both a pro and a con. I mean, you have the infrastructure there, but if you've been doing homeless housing or homeless services a certain way for 20 plus years to say, you know what, something different might work better can be a, a threatening or frightening thing. And this was a way to get those agencies involved in this process in, in doing something different and then seeing on, on a pilot scale that it really could work, and then we've been able to take that um, to a much larger scale across the community. Great, thank you. All right, so I imagine that a lot of people who are in the audience tonight um, are already involved, but would be curious about what are other things that they could do to be part of the solution. So I just wanted to give each of you a chance to, to share what are ways that that you think that volunteers can be really powerful in, in being leveraged towards ending homelessness in a community? So as you mentioned, we had 500 volunteers the first time we did the VI, and then we had over 600 the second time we did the VI. So in Santa Barbara, um, the community cares. So we have a couple of trainings. We would really encourage you, if you're interested, if you're already volunteering, we, we thank you. And if you're interested in volunteering to help solve homelessness, we have a two Common Ground Santa Barbara County trainings, March 15th and March 22nd. If you go to commongroundsb.org, you can read all about them. We have one in Santa Barbara City and one in Lompoc because we're trying to do a countywide effort to solve homelessness. So we really want to engage volunteers more. It's, it's a way you could become a Common Ground volunteer. We're also going to connect you to other agencies and organizations that need help. So we just want to continue to mobilize our volunteer effort. We've already seen, we have several teams out in different places that have helped people into housing. So it's, it's been successful. You just want to up it even more. One of the things I'm really working to do is help us align flexible local funding with the policies and the strategies and the data that tells us what works. So some of you are able to write a check to an agency. Write a check to an agency that's doing something that is functional and that is working and the data says is actually going to help us. Um, others of you can volunteer your time, like Jeff was saying. Some of you might be business people or landlords who we need to connect with. So I'm going to ask for you to reach out to us at C3Homes, that's C3HOMES, that's C3HOMES.org, and you can write to Jeff or I or Zara, and we'll get back in touch with you. 
And I would also say um, being a voice for this movement, it's really important that the communities across the country understand that housing first works, that it's effective for both the person being housed and for the community, and it's not a scary thing. Um, so getting the word out to people who, people talk about homelessness in the community, and if you see somebody doing, supporting an organization that may not be as, an, as effective, that may be doing a feeding program as opposed to getting on board with Housing First. Talk to them about why Housing First is effective and why you think that that's the way that they should go. There's so many things that, and you all know when we're doing this work, that we don't have the time to do or we don't have enough staff to do or there's just so many people that need to be housed. Um, and I, th I would think one of the things that we've done to to sort of, um, I don't know, maximize on the number of people that want to volunteer is, is, and it's based on Santa Cruz's model, their needs navigator model, or their WINGS program. And now we have Fresno WINGS, which is, um, you know, when we issue a voucher, then a volunteer um, picks up the person, takes them, helps them find an apartment, helps them fill out the lease paperwork, and helps get them housed. They try and, you know, round up furniture and, and do all of the all of the footwork that we don't have the staff or the money to pay the staff to do um, because everybody's doing everything else. So I think that if you can, or, or you know, there's the move-in kits idea where it's all of the supplies that they need to furnish an apartment, but those are the kinds of things that people enjoy getting getting involved in and it gives them the um you know, the sense that they're actually doing something and they're building a relationship with someone. And we've seen volunteers stick with with the person they helped house, you know, for a year or longer. Anytime they need something, then that's where that person goes. Cool. I think I'd imagine that'd be a very rewarding volunteer experience to actually move somebody into housing. That, that sounds kind of fun. All right. So I, I just wanted to open it up for you if you have questions of one another or things, things that this has brought up for you that you want to ask one another as well. I'm getting my tail kicked on a regular basis trying to get people to collaborate and coordinate. What are some hints on how we can be smarter and do what we do better? Yeah, so I touched on this uh, a little bit earlier, but, I, but that was one of the things that the 100,000 camp, 100, Homes campaign was most valuable for with us, is really letting organizations see that they could have a place in a, a larger picture of ending homelessness, that it wasn't so much it is my organization meeting its goals and are we going to get our funding next year, but what is Pasadena doing to end homelessness and how many people are we housing in Pasadena? Not how many is my organization housing, how many people are getting housed in our community? Um, so engaging each organization in what they can do best, what can they bring to the table? And different organizations have different strengths. Um, some have more capacity than, than others, but, but most of them can, can bring something to the table. Um, one of the things that um, we encountered is um, there, there was a, we, we had that whole like low hanging fruit phenomenon thing happening where the easiest to work with homeless population were being housed first. And um, so I thought really long and hard about how to address that and um, brought our rapid results team in on it. And what we decided was that um, we needed to sort of appeal to the financial aspect for people as well because they're worried about their funding. And um, so what we did is I just explained that HUD will never recognize us as a high performing community if we're not housing the most chronically and vulnerable homeless populations on the street. So if you want to be able to serve the, the population of people that maybe is a little, um, it, you know, needs a little less attention and, and maybe a little bit easier to house and a little bit easier, easier to get landlords to want to work with, then you're going to have to house this more vulnerable population. And it worked. Um, you know, most of the people that were in attendance at our meetings were, were kind of the, you know, director level that made those kinds of decisions. And so we kind of 
played it so that everybody was sort of working towards becoming one of those high performing communities and being able to bring more dollars into the community. Can I, can I throw my two cents in on that one? Yeah. All right. Um, I think collaboration is overrated. I think it can. Uh, thank you. There thank goes C3H. There you go. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm saying it can go too far. And um, so w the, the word I prefer is alignment, in that you as the leaders of the community set a direction and we are gonna be, this is where we're going. And, and you are all invited to go in this direction with us. And, and everyone's welcome to that. And then at some point, people either going in that direction with you or they aren't. And, and that's where then you can align around every, what, what's everybody's role in that. But one of the things I found when I did work in Times Square was um, I, I just got exhausted bringing along the status quo mongers, you know? And so uh, we just stopped inviting them to meetings, you know? Thank you. All right, applause. Yeah, we just we stopped inviting them to meetings. Now the problem with that is that what status quo mongers do is go to meetings, and so uh, the, uh, th so they were a little offended, you know, and and we were like, you're still invited, but this is what we're doing, you know, and and um, and so what we 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 started with 30 organizations who all had money to be doing something about homelessness in Times Square. And when we said, okay, well, what we're actually gonna do now is we're gonna house them instead of bringing them sandwiches and stuff. Um, would you like to be part of that? Only three signed up. Only three signed up. We said, all right, we'll work with you. And it was the business improvement district, the police, and a soup kitchen. And that's all we had. All the other people who were professional homeless service providers were, were AWOL, not, not present. They came around, they, you know, eventually, but we started with who was willing to work with us towards that shared goal. And, and, and then everyone else came around later. So the mongers can look for the exit signs <laughs> on the left Status and right. Quo, you know who you are. <laughs> One of the things that um, on that same in that same line is we our rapid results team was small. There was about eight of us, and we kept it at about eight of us. And so that that group of eight lined out the direction, and then we invited everybody to come with us. Um, we were lucky that everyone was on board and 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 went, but we did keep it a pretty small group so that it didn't get away from us. So we weren't trying to track people down for meetings so that we could delegate things to just a few people and we were sure to make to be able to make sure that they were getting done. So that's one thing I can say about keeping you know the core group a little bit smaller. I want to say something pithy about if you want to go uh, fast go alone and if you want to go far go together but I don't know I, why not just do both but but, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's a balance. I think there's a balance to be struck, and I think c collaboration gets too much play for collaboration's sake. Yeah, yeah. What other questions do you guys want to ask each other? How have you engaged people who are experiencing homelessness or who have experienced ho homelessness in your leadership to bring about change as well? Well, at a larger level, the co-chair of our Housing and Homeless Network is a formerly homeless person. And Dorothy, who I introduced earlier, is also a member of our Housing and Homeless Network. But we, we have one organization called Housing Works uh, the, that works with us very closely on our Project Housed uh, program in Pasadena. And that's really sort of their model, that, that as people get stabilized in housing, they begin to give back and, and become part of the community. And many of them do it by becoming outreach workers, by um, providing services to people to keep them housed and, and sort of bring them out of the housing once they become housed and get them engaged in the community. Um, so they've got a really great model for doing that. Um, we have a lot of representation from the homeless community on our continuum of care board. Um, but as far as when we started the 100,000 Homes campaign, we, um, we engaged three women 
and it was kind of hit and miss. Like sometimes we'd get all three and sometimes we'd only get one. Or, um, and then recently we were funded to do the pit count. The VA funded our pit count this year and um, we were able to give them stipends. And once we, once we got the stipends funded and now we're going to try and figure out how we can keep getting the stipends funded because they were there. And, um, and they were super helpful and their input was seriously priceless. Like we could have, we could have n not done it nearly as well without them. So um, I think stipends turned out to be a really great thing. Paying people, who knew? I know. All right. <laughs> All right. It wasn't very much. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, in the in, I think in the interest of time, any last questions of one another? Any burning, burning? This might be your last chance to ask each other questions in front of this audience tonight. <laughs> Reducing homelessness is real. Ending homelessness is not real. Okay, so. I'm aiming toward ending it. Yeah, yep, yep. Let's get okay, real. Let's, I think that's what's happening, right? All right, thank you, thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you.